Dr. Stephanie Green has been leading the way. She's a pioneer, actually, in the field of medical assistance in dying since 2016, when the laws in this country changed. She has written an incredible memoir. She reveals the reasons people might seek an assisted death. She talks about how the process actually works, what the event, what that day looks like, the reactions of all those involved, and of course, what it feels like be her. It's intense, it's powerful, it's compassionate, and I believe it will help patients who are suffering and their families explore their end-of-life choices in an intelligent way. Dr. Stephanie Green, This is Assisted Dying is the uh, title of the book here, and that is the story she tells. Welcome, Stephanie. Really nice. Really Thanks for having me, uh, giving me the opportunity to speak with you and your listeners. And and I'm to call you Stephanie because you write in the book at one point when one of your patients actually referred to you as Stephanie you felt like you'd bridged that gap you were no longer Dr. Green exactly please feel welcome to call me Stephanie absolutely okay (laughs) that's great so I I, there's so many things I want to uh, cover but you have told um, the whole story of, of medical assistance and dying through your patients and through the people that you deal with. So let's start at the beginning. When the laws changed in 2016, you had been a, uh, a maternity nurse delivering babies and doing all that for most of your professional life. Um, and you decided to make a, a change. And Harvey was your or, uh, first patient. Now, I'm sure the names have been changed to uh, sure. to protect everybody here. Tell us the story of Harvey. Sure. I, I feel, I just have to say, I feel incredibly grateful that Harvey and his family were my first, uh, my first experience. Um, yeah. Like many patients, they were extraordinary, but the support that Harvey had around him uh, was really remarkable. Harvey was, uh, was a, a feisty guy, an independent guy, a self-made man, who really had been following the news and had been hearing about assisted dying as he was declining through his own medical illness. And he knew what he wanted. And he wondered whether he would have enough time, whether the law would change in time for him. And he was literally, uh, you know, metaphorically knocking on my door with papers in hand, ready to start this process at the beginning. So he knew what he wanted. He was very clear. uh, And that, that that was, of course, helpful to me. And the support his family gave him through this process was remarkable and loving and really, really helped open my eyes and schooled me to how this could look. And in a way, because you had made this decision in part for personal uh, reasons, you know, you were working uh, 24 hour day shifts, sometimes, you know, deliveries last for two days, not uh, three hours. You wanted to spend more time with your family. And this was kind of a new and evolving area of medicine but this this is a brave step you you know you're not sure how even your medical colleagues are going to look at you sure I mean I'd spend over 20 years as a maternity physician preparing women and their families for birth delivering them caring for their newborns pretty chaotic transitional times really exciting Um, And this was definitely, you know, a a departure. But as you said, you know, as I was getting older, it was getting harder to do that work uh, as intensely as it is. And I was looking for other avenues, perhaps to explore Um, a bit of a perfect storm that, you know, the the conversation about assisted dying in Canada had been going on for 30 years. I've been following that since since medical school. I'd been up to date with the Carter case. I saw it come to fruition. I heard that news announced and, and like many people, I think in, in medicine, I wondered who's going to do this work. Um, you know, I've always been really interested in that intersection between medicine and ethics and law and always kind of fulfilled that through women's health and reproductive rights. But, but, the, but the real core that I've been taught in my career in medicine was patient-centered care. That's a concept that was taught to me in medical school, practiced in residency. And I, you know, I take a certain pride in thinking that I I fulfilled in my in my 20 year career. So this seemed like an opportunity to to use that to really recognize and respect uh, patient centered care. And death is such a universal human experience. There's there's almost there's very little discussion about it, considering that. And yet right. and yet it's, it's probably one of it's, it's a really great example of when patient centered care is probably so important. You know, it, it just it really called to me that way. 
just the process that you had to go in and and I and I don't I just I loved you for being so brave about writing about this. Here you are as a medical doctor, do no harm. We're there to offer treatment and try to save lives. You you embrace this, and then you're you're going to this first occasion with Harvey. What do you wear? What do you say? How do you look? What are the phrases you look you use? What happens if somebody freaks out in, in the final moments? Like just yes, because in your inside your head. Sure. I mean, I I think. I think maybe one thing that that I hope comes through in this book is that it, physicians and nurses and healthcare professionals were, were all human. Uh, this was truly a big blind step to do this work initially. You know the the, the cliche, the, the 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 phrase in medicine is "see one, do one, teach one," and that's how we often learn through an apprenticeship. You know, assisted dying was not something we were going to see and then do. We had to really take that big blind step ourselves. So sure, I had been to Amsterdam and I had spoken with colleagues who had done this work and gleaned as much as I could from them and, you know, tried to absorb every piece of advice they could give me. And I felt I had the, 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 the technical skill and the, and the information in my head. I knew what was supposed to happen, but, but as a a human being, um, you know, it's scary. It's a, it's a bit overwhelming the first time you do something. So I, I think that I was able to I think I was able to draw on my experience as a maternity doctor, where where I had been in a room with laboring women, kind of choreographing event, recognizing that the that the events that were unfolding, I was supposed to be guiding them and be knowledgeable and, and help people with that knowledge. But ultimately, I'm not the most important person in the room when that birth takes place or when that death takes place. And I think calling on those skills and recognizing that really was what I could lean on as a crutch as I moved forward that first day. You talked about even the language that you came to use, and you said your time as a maternity doctor had had helped shape that. You know, do you call it a procedure? Do you call it an event? And and you actually came to see it as a delivery in in the same way uh, as you had seen it in your earlier life. Yeah, I, I I love that I uh, that I found that 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 it, that it came to me that I used that I I still find today five and a half years later even when I'm talking to professional colleagues who are familiar with the work people are uncomfortable with the language around this care they don't know what to call it they don't know what to call that final procedure or that final event and to me it really is a delivery of a sort instead of delivering a you know a baby into life it's really delivering a person through their death and into that other transition it, it, it's a delivery a little bit from suffering, from intolerable suffering, which by definition in our law, they they are experiencing. So it's that transition, it's a recognition of that delivery that I, that I, that really calls to me. And I, I refer to these now as deliveries. Uh, There were a couple of stories that, uh, that really uh, touched me for sure, because you use this phrase that you came to know the person um, that you were helping deliver out of their pain and suffering as, as a suffering as a woman who had lived a life of generous intention, because as the family gathered around her, and you weren't sure what was happening right at the beginning, they just started uttering words like tomatoes or knitted socks or just tell that story. Yeah, Katie. Katie was another. So many, so many remarkable people. Katie and her family, again, very extraordinary family. She was definitely the matriarch of that family. Uh, This was a, a couple, she and her husband, Ken, had lived on that acreage for 70 years. They, they built that farm, they grew that farm, they reaped the bounty of that farm, they raised six children and all their grandchildren and kept their great-grandchildren within the region. She was really the force in that family. But at 90-something years of age, you know, her body gave out and she had a very quick decline uh, into a shadow of who she was and knew very much what she wanted for her end of life. Um, and and very a very humble woman and very very quiet. By the time I met her, she was quite weak. So we didn't have a chance to explore all the details of her of her life. But as we gathered around her at the very end, as she was dying, as she was falling asleep and passing on, as she was being delivered from that suffering she was experiencing, there was this spontaneous outpouring of moments and things that she was known for, just kind of 
off the tip of their tongue, strawberry jam she used to make every year, knitting socks for everyone, uh, taking the grandchildren without advance notice, all kinds of um, th these statements just started coming out of the mouths of her family. And in those eight or nine minutes while she was dying, I learned a tremendous amount about Katie and what she was known for and what she was loved for and how she had touched all these members of her family simply through these, these spontaneous words that started uh, appearing. It was, it was really a beautiful, beautiful tribute to her. I, I could just see that scene and grandkids particularly are like that. I mean, you think of your grandma with one, you know, you have an image, you have a thought and it might be cookies. It might be knitted mittens, you know, you don't know, but, but for that to come forward just seemed to really, it was an, it was an incredible tribute to her. Yeah. A really, a really strong and beautiful tribute to her. Uh, and, and so spontaneous. It was uh just lovely. I think in the course of this work, I have to say I've been witness to some some really tragic scenes, some very emotional yeah. scenes, but also some remarkable beauty. Uh, it's really maybe counterintuitive for people to think that. But it, it's well, I know there was an accidental situation where somebody's cell phone went off, and and the music on the cell phone was "Stairway to Heaven." <laughs> exactly. There are there are the kooky moments as well. I won't give all of them away, but there were definitely many. <laughs> and then the deliberate choice by another to have "Highway to Hell" play. <laughs> yeah, we've heard some interesting medical, some interesting musical choices for sure. Choices. <laughs> The other story that really struck me um, was Helen, the serious smoker mm -hmm. with the grandson uh, who mm -hmm. lived under her roof because his mother was uh, an addict and not able to raise him. Mm -hmm. And, and um, that was not so pretty in the end. Why don't you give us that uh, version? <laughs> yeah, not, not all stories are as beautiful <laughs> and as loving as, as say, Katie's. And we, we right. see that. And, and I think Helen's is a good example of that. Helen, Helen had, had decades worth of unexpressed emotion and feelings towards her grandson that uh, she'd, she'd just not been able to explore. And she really, although she knew exactly what she wanted and how she wanted to die, she literally stopped me from proceeding until she could find the closure she, closure she needed. She needed to say things to Tim before she could rest. And she insisted on doing so, and she let loose. There was no stopping her once she started. For a woman who was short of breath and had needed oxygen while talking at rest, she did not hold back. She let it known what, you know, what she meant and what she needed to say. And I think it provided, I think it's a good example of, of the opportunity that the assisted dying can give for finding closure, hopefully not at the very last moment, like Helen did. Yeah. But I mean, this was dying. a son that was a bit of a, a, a useless, you know, he, he was taking money from her and living off her and selling her goods so that he right. could buy drugs exactly. and this and that. And she just gave him hell she on did. her deathbed. Yeah. She did. And I, I'd like to think that we have an opportunity to help families find closure before that final moment. But I yeah. think uh, she's a good representation of, uh, of the closure that can happen and is really important for people. Let's talk about that, because you sort of set up shop uh, in B.C., uh, Ironically, Vancouver Island seems to be a hotbed of this. You have more people there uh, per capita that are willing to uh, offer maid than than other places. Uh, but when your phones started ringing and people started asking how, and the law changes were new. This is uh, 2014, and the decision had just come down. Um, saying that people could seek this and their conditions had to be irremediable and they needed to be, you know, in serious pain and close to death. So, so you've got people phoning you saying, this is it. I, I can't take it anymore. Mm. Then what was the process and what happens then when that person says that to you? Right. So there is a pretty clear outline process that needs to happen. I mean, in Canada, if somebody wants an assisted death, they do need to request it. They need, they need to request it themselves. Nobody can trigger this on their behalf. It actually needs to be written and witnessed and um, they need to submit that. And then 
There's a process where two different independent clinicians need to assess whether the patient has met all the eligibility criteria medically and legally. And really what we do when someone comes forward is we start the conversation. We, we meet with them. We explore why they're, why they're coming forward now, what their issue is, you know, and, and, and in the back of our minds, we're always assessing those eligibility criteria. And very, very briefly, in case your listeners aren't aware that they are, that the patient needs to be over 18, they need to make, they need to be eligible for government funded uh, health care. They need to make a voluntary request, not under any sort of coercion. They need to have the capacity to make this request and understand the rel- you know, the w- what the request means and the outcome of that. And they need to have to give informed consent. And they need to have what's called a grievous and irremediable condition, which we could talk many hours about what that means. But essentially, it means that the patient has a very serious illness that's incurable, that they're in an advanced state of decline in function, and that they're suffering intolerably. And all of that needs to be assessed and be found to be true before a patient can actually move forward with an assisted death. So it's a a rigorous outlined process with rigorous uh, eligibility criteria. And then on top of that, there are procedural safeguards as well that that they have to meet. And I know the laws are different in different parts of the country, but you have to have a second medical person with you um, when you go to the person's home to actually perform this procedure? So you don't actually, I mean, the, so, no? so okay. to clarify, so the, the, the law that I just outlined, that's a federal legislation. So that's true yeah. in all corners of the country, but because made is administered and delivered provincially, there are subtle differences right. here and there, but those eligibility criteria are always true. Um, there are some programs where at, at least two clinicians or healthcare providers need to be present for the provision of the care, but actually um, that's not the majority. Um, Many of us will have a nurse with us or a colleague with us for a variety of reasons, but I know several colleagues that work in this country in various places that work alone because they have the skill set to do that. So it's uh, it's a little bit based on clinician skill set and comfort level and a little bit on local rules and regulations. Yeah, it's because I just went through this with a friend in the, the fall and there had to be two people there and they had to, from the home, call the coroner um, and go through all of this. And then the family had to talk or a friend had to talk to the coroner and said, yes, this is what happened. And they were at the right place at the right time. So to be honest, that is a somewhat unfortunate need yeah. in the province of Ontario, which is yeah. the only province that requires that. There is excellent oversight in Ontario, but it does require notifying the coroner and having that conversation from the home, which I think is cumbersome, uh, yeah. time consuming and quite awkward. Uh, that is not required in other provinces. There's other forms of oversight. And I I feel a little badly for the families involved in yeah. that moment who are mourning their loss and having to verify with the nurse navigator with the events of the No, happened. no, exactly. I, I couldn't agree more. Okay, so that first assessment gets done and sometimes the family doctor is not comfortable with MAID and so you have to find a second assessor to come in and say, yes, we think the criterion has been met here. Then what? Then on the day of you go to the person's home and 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 just walk us through what yeah. happens. So so preparation is important. I like the word choreograph. We tend to choreograph yeah. those events with the family, so we have a good sense of what they need to have happen. But but standardly, what would happen on that day once all the all the procedures been the process has been fulfilled before that we would I would show up. I I work with an IV nurse specialist with me all the time. We have a I, I always have a private conversation with the patient first when I immediately arrive to make sure. This is truly what they want. They haven't changed their mind, that they still have the ability to make this decision and are quite, quite adamant this is what they want. Um, You know, the IV, if that's what's being used, is cited. And I I typically have a a, a preparation session with any of the gathered guests who are there. I outline the order of events they're going to see, the medications we're going to use, what they might notice. I try to answer all their questions because I want this to be transparent and there's no comfort in this, but I want them to feel like they're ready for it. So we, we go through that process and then, and then we, then we um, try to accommodate whatever it is that the patient has requested. So if they want everyone to gather around their bed, we'll do that. If they want music playing, we'll do that. If they want a prayer or a reading or uh, a toast with champagne, or maybe a very quiet event just on the back deck with just themselves and the spouse. I mean, there's a variety of ways this can be choreographed with or without the pet. Um, So we, 
we try to accommodate what they want as long as it's, as I say to my patients, as long as it's safe and legal, we'll do it. So it's a yeah. variety of settings. We do that. And then we, then we proceed through the procedure uh, step by step, asking for last words, making sure everything's been said, finding that closure, making sure again that the patient is ready and seeking their final consent right immediately before we begin. And then I administer the medications that that quite quickly uh, allow them to fall asleep into a light, comfortable sleep, and then a deeper comatose state. And then ultimately their breathing stops and then their heart will stop and they'll, and they'll die, uh, usually in the course of about eight minutes. You know, after, so that, after and that, and that you, you do debrief as well. I don't know if you yeah, want to get into yeah. that, but yeah. No, I just, there's, there's two procedures because you could also, there's an oral medication, but most people choose the ID, the IV, because I think they feel safer with a medical professional in charge somehow. That seemed to be what came yeah, from I, the story. I think there's probably a number of factors. I mean, there was certainly in the early days, we didn't really have the ideal medications available, which we do now. I think there are still very few people who are adamant about that autonomous control and want to hold the cup and drink the liquid and say they did it themselves. And so for that, we were very yeah. grateful to have this option. Um, but yes, out of over 20,000 assisted deaths that have happened in this country, there are uh, less than 20 that have been an oral self-administered uh, event. So yes, absolutely. The, the most common is a clinician administered intravenous procedure, which provides some comfort to the patient. And then, and then it's kind of left to you again to deal with the family and the fallout and the sadness or relief, or I'm sure a mixture of all of those emotions are there. Yeah, standardly, I always hold a debrief with the with the family. I mean, we all have our own way. But personally, after I have finished the procedure, I excuse myself quite quickly to leave the family and the loved ones alone with their with their loved one for some time, private time. Um, and then we gather together for a debriefing to talk about how they are and if there's any surprises, how they're feeling, making sure they have the resources they need for that day and for going forward, you know, clarifying that I'll take care of all the administrative work. And mm -hmm. I'm just kind of recognizing that I, I think the day of the procedure is, in my experience, the day of the procedure is always much harder for the family and the loved ones than the person who's dying. The person who's dying is quite certain, quite determined. They're quite calm. They all tell me they've slept well the night before. They actually yeah. are generally happier and more uh, calm than they have been when I first than when I first met them. The family, however, is left to grieve the loss, and that that's where the real work is. And I think sometimes recognizing that explicitly with them and validating that with them, uh, it can be really really helpful to them. Um, so I, I try to do that uh, when it's when it's you know appropriate to do so. And um, and and I'm always a little surprised, tinged with the sadness. There's always almost always a real sense of gratitude for the work yeah. that's happened and for the, the ability to relieve their loved one to suffering. So that's, it's always that mixture. There's always a paradox involved. One of the, the things I learned was that, and, and my friend that I referred to, she was absolutely adamant right from the get-go. This was her fourth round with cancer. I mean, there was, she just did not want to go through this, but given access to resources, the, the maid doctor could only come at, 5 p.m. that day and it was a very very long day for everybody so you know earlier the sooner uh, that seemed to be what yeah. we all said afterwards we went downstairs we never want to see that again <laughs> you know this work has taught me a lot about timing yeah again yeah. it's quite it's quite independent there there are there are families that want the day together they have yeah. something planned for the morning. They want to have brunch. They want to have the children in the afternoon. They specifically want us to come late. But the vast majority of people do actually prefer kind of a late morning. So they have just yeah. a short period together and they don't have to wait all day long. I'll tell you, though, the thing I learned the most doing this work is to be prompt. When <laughs> I go to show up for a scheduled death, if I come five minutes early, people are offended that I'm pushing this or that I'm eager or that there's something wrong. They're not ready. They feel a little rushed. So I definitely can't do that. But if I show up five minutes late, there's an anxiety in the house. And especially from the patient yeah. who's worried I'm stuck in traffic or I can't get there. Right. I have learned to arrive on the dot. <laughs> no, that's, that's very good advice. I mean, on, on the one hand, what you're doing is taking away that fear of death, giving them back control. And then as you say, five minutes can, can, put somebody, you know, into a state of panic. Absolutely. I, I, 
I want to come back a little bit to the um, to the wording and the laws around this. Uh, the Supreme Court, in its ruling on on Carter way back when, was much more generous uh, and open minded than what the law itself became in 2014. Um, and then we'll get to the subsequent uh, 2016. We'll get to this. Uh, yeah, um, we'll get to the subsequent changes. Sure, that have come, but. Um, what, how do you read that? I mean, the court was pretty clear and then government put more and more and more constraint on it. Yeah, I, I read that as a cautious government. I mean, I, I, you know, I can I can see this from both sides, to be honest. I think it was a tremendous change. I mean, the, the, the high court decision is, is a huge philosophical change for our society, which we were ready for, which we yeah. wanted, which we welcomed, which we you know, we, we, we embraced. And at the same time, I think the government was cautious and not having experience with it, not knowing exactly all that we do now. I think that they, for better or for worse, uh, legislated uh, criteria that were more restrictive than the court anticipated or, you know, encouraged or allowed. Like, as you said, right. they were more generous. Um, so I, I understand why that happened. I think that they probably perhaps knowingly aired, uh, specifically by adding an element to the law that required patients to have some relationship with the end of their life. I mean, the court's decision was very clear in not uh, requiring the patients uh, who are suffering to be at end of life or near end of life or specifically within a certain period of life. And yet our legislation really uh, needed, really felt the need to address that and added this clause that you know, the patient's death needed to be reasonably foreseeable was the term they used. And that that was, I think that was very controversial from the beginning and created yeah. a lot of troubles for clinicians and for patients and for their families, and ultimately required a, a challenge in the courts, which most legal scholars knew would come. And most legal scholars anticipated would reverse that, you know, ability to, to, to restrict the law that way. And, and that did happen. And, and the waiting months. periods then those kinds of things. So then the the uh, AB and the Truchon decision came and we've been, well, I've been through both of these situations in, uh, in the Senate. The next decision came. We actually, and this is an area I want to get into, you know that I care about it a lot, is the whole question of advanced directives. So sure. the Senate put forward that amendment, the government rejected it. And it puzzles me for the following reasons is because Everything that we talk about here is an advanced directive. If you sign a DNR, you go into the hospital for surgery, that is an advanced directive. If I call you and ask you to provide MAID for me, that is an advanced directive. Where is it really, Where? why is that issue so difficult? I think, so it's a great question. I think the um, the real issue is in the weeds. So I think there is, as you mentioned, there's, there's tremendous support for the idea of an advanced request for MAID. And it does seem very much on par with things we already do. We have advanced requests for withdrawing life-sustaining treatment or not starting life-sustaining treatment. These are all very accepted in our society. Yeah. So this doesn't seem like a big leap. But I think in the actual operationalization of it, we need to look at who is it that would trigger the the process going forward and right. and um and and what if there isn't contempt or there is or isn't contemporary suffering at that time so advanced requests just to be clear is when you well pr presumably it's when you've been given a diagnosis already or not that's debatable of a yeah. of an illness that you know will cause your ultimate decline in death and you're saying when a b and c are true i would like you to end my life so the the issue is in who decides when A, B, and C are true? Who notifies the doctor when they think it's true? Who makes the final decision that it's true? Whose responsibility is it the, the, the families, a designated third person, the clinician? That kind of detail needs to be worked out and, and to be debated and to be comfortable with um, because it's not so easy to, to walk in and, and end someone's life. We need to really feel like due process has happened. And so I think it's in the weeds. I, I do, and but the other he stories we hear then from people who know, for example, they have dementia, or they have Alzheimer's, and we've talked to our friend Ron Posner about this and others, it's certainly the case in even my own family, that what we force people uh, to do because we're still in the weeds and we haven't been able to wrestle this, this question is that then they have to take 
their life earlier than they want. They they need to commit suicide to yeah. prevent them from getting to that. It's it's time missed. It's it's an early death, and we're forcing all of that responsibility on them without the support that you can offer for people. You know, this diagnosis is cancer. This diagnosis is is Alzheimer's. The outcomes are bad either way. Outcome, yeah. I, I think I am. I'll tell you in my in my personal opinion. I have to tell you, it's a little bit unfortunate that Canada has uh, has approached these these more contentious issues. I think in the reverse order. I think that the will and the desire and the knowledge. Uh, to to regulate around the idea of assist of of advanced requests is, is there, and we should have already had or be having that conversation now and regulating and moving forward. And I think our colleagues in Quebec are showing one path towards yeah. that with their recent report, and that should be front and center. I think the way the law changed, the way the 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 legislative amendments happened, we are in fact actually struggling with and focusing on the issue of uh, mental health patients. And if that's the sole underlying condition, and I have to tell you, that's a more complex situation, yeah. with less, with less, um, less consistency across clinicians, um, less consistency across providers, it, yeah. more divided in yeah. the community. So it's taking a lot of energy and it's really, really difficult. And it's, it's a little unfortunate it didn't go the other way around. I think we could have tackled this issue of advanced requests sooner and maybe have already found a way. I do think Are it's there, complicated, but I do think it's possible. Of course it's complicated, but we must have seen examples of this. As you say, in your early stages, you were traveling to Amsterdam and meeting people who lived in countries that had years of experience with this. Has yes. anybody figured that out? Of course they have. I mean, I say, of course, it, it's yeah. not a common event, but yes, our colleagues in the, in Europe have done this and are doing this and have, have, have models of care of, of, of how this works. And they have data of what's been happening. And we have, you know, much of our system has been modeled on the experience of our Dutch and Belgian colleagues. So I do think uh, we could learn a lot and, and uh, import what works for us and tweak it for our own purposes. It's not brand new. Because even with diseases other than Alzheimer's, where that final confirmation may be very difficult because they've lost faculty and they don't have the ability to really consent and say, yes, I still agree with what I said yesterday or, or five minutes ago. I mean, that might be true in, in more physical illnesses as, as well. If you've lost the ability to verbalize or if you are in a, a state of coma, some variation on that. So that we've obviously found ways to deal with that. Yeah, we, we're already dealing with issues of people who have difficulty communicating in various ways. We have lots of technology and tips and tricks for communicating with people who can't speak. There's tapping a toe board or pointing or writing or using an eye board. There's lots of ways to communicate. Um, and we've also dealt with the the, one of the specific issues of someone who's already been found eligible for MAID and then, of course, goes on to lose capacity while they're waiting for their procedure to advance. Right. We have now the waiver of final consent and the Audrey Parker story, and, and I think there's a better understanding of that. That's been a tremendous change, a tremendous amendment that has allowed us to deal with situa very specific situations where capacity is lost. So it's not totally foreign to us. I, I agree with you. But I, I, I'd be remiss if I didn't point out, and I know that you and I have discussed this before, yeah. but just... So your listeners know there, there is a way for people with dementia to access made under the current law. It's just not simple, but uh, it has happened. It can be done. It doesn't work for everyone, but there is a model of care for that in existence. Well, we'll explain that because it gets to be about the timeline uh, because with Alzheimer's in particular, I mean, you might be ill for three or four or five years before your body actually shuts down. So that, yes. that waiver of consent, in what context can it be used? Yeah, so I think, I mean, it, very briefly, it is about the timeline. And, and even before the waiver of consent, it's about following someone and knowing them and getting to know them as they're declining. So we use a model called 10 minutes to midnight, where we, we assess patients along the way of their decline. And if midnight marks the time that they lose capacity to make their own healthcare decisions, the, the, the idea is that at 10 minutes to midnight, when, when they're very close to that time, they can actually fulfill potentially all the eligibility criteria for MAID to be in an advanced state of decline, to be suffering already, to, you know, to, to be asking for this and still have the ability to consent to it. So there is a, there is a model for that care. What the waiver of final consent has allowed, although I, I don't know that it was meant for this, but right. at that point, at 10 minutes to midnight, uh, patients uh, previously and currently have a choice at that time to actually proceed with MAID when they're able to give their consent 
at that moment, or now with the waiver of final consent, they could say, uh, you know, I think that I'm going to want an assisted death very soon. Um, I think it's probably going to be maybe, you know, three months from now, but I, I don't know. But I, I know that I want to live out every single moment while I still have my my wits about me. I still have my capacity. And rather than die now, I'd like to, to squeeze every drop of juice out of life. And so I'm going to make an agreement with you now that says on or before that date that I write down, you know, three months in advance, you have permission to provide me an assisted death. And if I lose capacity in the meantime, you still have permission to do so. And it's not a criminal act to assist me. And that's what the waiver offers these patients uh, so they can live to the very last moment of their life. Because that's the other thing I think we need to keep reminding people that this is all still going on under the auspices of the criminal code. (laughs) Yes. The (laughs) clinicians that do this work are very aware of that. Uh, There is a significant criminal liability if we get this wrong. Yeah. Yeah. So we're inching toward quality of life um, being and the loss thereof being an acceptable reason to uh, ask for and be given made. I, I, I maybe I, I'm that not sure that day is, too, I, I think that day is probably further away. I, I think that one of the essential elements that that will likely remain in the Canadian model, though, I am not a crystal ball reader, uh, (laughs) is that the element of suffering, I think, is very important uh, to to the public, to the clinicians. The element that the patient is suffering uh, is um, seems almost pivotal uh, to the eligibility. So it's it's a little bit less clear if someone can just say that they've had a completed life, that they feel their time is up, that they feel they've given their best and they're no longer themselves. You know, would that person eventually uh, be qualified for made in Canada. I, I don't know that that doesn't really exist in our in, in our colleagues models right. overseas. I don't know that we'll be the first to do that. I, I expect that's further away. And I'm, I'm not sure that will ever happen. It seems that the changes in Canada come only after at great cost and sacrifice and sometimes beyond their actual life, people go to court uh, to force governments to move move an inch, move an inch, move an inch. Is that really the best way to do this? It's certainly not the best way to do this. I think it's, I think it's unfortunate. I think it's a little bit cowardly of our leaders. I I think, you know, to, to, to have radical change in this country, in our laws, be on the backs of the families and the patients who have the courage and the strength and frankly, the finances to come forward to, to make this change is grossly unfair. And it makes for very, very slow and uh, erratic change. And we would be remiss if we didn't uh, uh, point out the incredible, courageous women predominantly who have changed the law in this country. Sue Rodriguez, uh, Kay yeah. Carter, Gloria Taylor, uh, Nicole Gladue, and of course, Jean Touchon, of course, that man. Yeah. You know, these are the names of the people who have made the difference. And it's not fair that it was uh, because of them, Uh, you know, all respect to them. But I I think our leaders could maybe make some proactive changes from here, knowing what we know now with five and a half years of data, with information from from the clinicians who do this work, what works, what doesn't work. You know, I I don't know that we should we should necessitate that in the future. You know, one of the stories in the book that really has nothing to do with MAID is the loss of your own father. Mm-hmm. Um, and going to see him and being with him um, on his deathbed, and then realizing from the daughter's point of view rather than the doctor's point of view, uh, the chaos that uh, that ensues um, of death of any kind, and it it kind of gave you a new perspective on what were you what you were doing. For sure, I, I definitely have colleagues who've come to this because of personal experience. I mean, I, I hadn't come to this because of experience. My father's death was was ten years before our law even changed. But yes, you know, on reflecting back, you know, I, I did learn a lot from that experience. And as I as I said at the beginning, we are also human, and we are also still learning what what mistakes we've made and what we could maybe do better going forward. And and the experience of my of my father's death and my role in it. And my experience of the turmoil that surrounds those end of life moments, especially when there is not closure of emotional issues, especially when there have not been conversations about uh, what people do and don't want. You know, I think that is unfortunately the most common situation that people encounter. And I think we can do better. And I, I see now there are better ways to, to find closure. And I see that there are better ways 
to prepare for end of life. And I, I take those lessons from that experience and from the experiences I have now. And I, I, I hope, I hope with this book, I hope to, to encourage conversation. If nothing else, I just want people to have conversation. Death is universal. We should be talking about it. Whether you want or choose an assisted death is irrelevant. Yeah. But to be able to talk about such an important milestone in one's life, honestly, with our loved ones, uh, can only be a positive thing. And, and I, hope that, I hope that my book will, will, will facilitate that. And and the one phrase that I, I particularly liked is listen to the family member who is dying. Uh, you may have your own views or your own resistance or you don't want your mother or your father, or your brother, or your sister to go, but let them choose um, whether or not they want to live through their dying. Yeah, again, patient-centered care. This is the one time I actually tell people explicitly you might have been giving to your family and your and your friends all your life. This is the one time you're allowed to be selfish. What's important yeah. to you becomes important to me. You want stairway to heaven plane? That's what's <laughs> going to play. You want your spouse there? They'll be there. You don't want them there? They won't be. This is the time for you to decide. You want to tell your grandson that he better smarten up. <laughs> yes. This is the moment. This is your moment. <laughs> Just some very, very... Um... Well, the to, the storytelling itself is very courageous, but to get into yeah. the, to see these situations ha- happen, it's a very very uh, powerful book. So, thank you, Stephanie, for the book and for what you do and for the fight you're fighting. We're all very very grateful. Thank you, I appreciate that. Thanks, Dr. Stephanie Green. Her book is "This Is Assisted Dying: A Doctor's Story of Empowering Patients at the End of Their Life." And uh, it is an important read for families, I think, to even do it together, not just individuals. So thanks again, Stephanie. We'll talk again soon. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.